Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, the number one online news show according to a poll I just made up in my head right now. Hit that like button and subscribe to feed the algorithm gods and let's just jump into it. Now, first up today, in news that just makes me wanna dunk my or someone else's head into a deep fryer, let's talk about Cameron Harris. So Cameron, in 2018, he was 18 years old and he was racing a Mustang that he had just received from his parents and he hit a mother and young daughter, killing them both. But reportedly, Cameron was participating in a street race he was driving 100 miles per hour. With all this, he ended up pleading guilty to vehicular homicide, and in April, he was sentenced to 24 years in prison. And now, what we're seeing is that Cameron, who is 21, he has strangely gotten a substantial group of fans and supporters on TikTok. Like, even though he has no videos to view, he has 2 million followers. Videos with the hashtag Cameron Heron have been viewed 1.8 billion times, and the hashtag Justice for Cameron being viewed 26.3 million times. Right, and when you go through these videos, a lot of them just include footage of him in court with a sad face or a heartbreak emoji. With the main idea being that these people think that a 24 year sentence is just too harsh, saying things like one hour of fun, 24 years behind bars, feel sad for him, drive safe. Others saying things like innocent and handsome also. Several outlets reporting that a number of people talk about his eyes, calling him too cute. A change.org petition to lessen his sentence is 28,000 signatures. And he also has people supporting him on Twitter. With his mom even going on to tell the Tampa Bay Times that there is quote, almost like an obsession, an unhealthy obsession with her son. And adding that some people have actually called her in the middle of the night, primarily from Middle Eastern countries. And also saying things have turned scary with people stalking friends and family on social media, hacking accounts, and even flooding prisons with phone calls. And so with all of this weirdness, right, you have the Tampa Bay Times taking a look to, to call into question how real the obsession is. Speaking to Shelby Grossman at the Stanford Internet Observatory, who said that it looks like these posts come from a mix of people who are genuinely sympathetic towards Cameron and other, quote, suspicious accounts strongly resembling those used by Middle East digital marketing firms. Right, like on one hand, there is evidence that some people are real, including the phone calls and the fact that some have sent photos of their IDs to the Tampa Bay Times to confirm that they were real after the Twitter accounts were taken down. With also a spokesperson for a company that basically sells TikTok bots saying that they looked at the videos about Heron and say they looked legitimately viral. But on the other hand, you also had another expert noting to the Times that some websites with articles about him looked fishy, with some content looking hastily put together or even spelled wrong, indicating it was part of a hired campaign. But even with that, the Times notes that the motive here is really odd and hard to understand. And Heron's attorney himself speculating that maybe this just took off because his sentencing was on YouTube, but also insisting that none of this activity originated with him or the family. So it's this weird random story, but if there is a place I can end if you're someone that is standing, Cameron, he's too pretty for prison. Uh, please get your head examined. He drove his car through a woman and her 21 month old daughter. There is no sympathy coming from me. Or how about this? We get rid of the prison sentence, but we put him in the middle of the street and put him on the opposite end of the situation. We see how he holds up against a Mustang. There's a conversation to be had around accidents happen, but I don't consider you driving 100 miles per hour as an accident. It's not a whoopsie, it's a legal age adult saying fuck everybody else. And all we're seeing with this situation is the law saying fuck you right back and good. But because of the Philip DeFranco show, that's the story, my opinion, and I pass the question off to you, whether you agree or disagree with me, because sometimes with stories like this, my emotions get the best of me. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding this? Then, in very interesting movie and entertainment news, we're seeing either a very, very interesting test or the flailing of an industry that is horrified right now. Right, coming out of the pandemic, we've seen just a slew of different narratives. The perceived successes and failures of the hybrid model, movies going online at the same time as they're going into theaters. That in part seeming like the reason we saw Black Widow had one of the worst second week collapses in box office revenue for any Marvel movie. You have Scarlett Johansson suing Disney, box office numbers not really where people would love to see them. So now the latest change and test that we're seeing is that A24 is taking The Green Knight starring Dev Patel and making it available online, but for just one night only during its theatrical run. So the movie came out July 30th. It's been reviewed well so far. It's made a modest $12.6 million. And with that, there is concern because of course we're seeing a surge of the Delta variant right now. And so A24 is like, okay, let's let's test this. August 18th, uh, you can purchase this for a four hour window, $20. Let's see what happens because it's kind of exclusive, time sensitive. Do we see a surge? of buys. Also, but making it available very easily in a digital form, does that lead to a surge of piracy? But in a little over a week, we'll be able to see if this is a boom or a bust, especially as we're seeing uh, theatrical only releases like Free Guy coming up this weekend. There's a lot of hype around it. It's a Ryan Reynolds movie. And it's gonna be interesting to see any and all of these numbers. Then in celebrity news, it's got people talking. We had Lil Nas X making some headlines and, and it is interesting. You know, when you see Lil Nas X in his music videos on social media, he's really unapologetically himself, completely fine with getting in your face, 
If you swing on him, he swings back. But in this new variety video, you can tell that there's there's a lot of concern, there's scary situations, uh, there's fear. Right, with the magazine specifically asking him about anti-gay statements that have come out from a variety of rappers recently, to which Lil Nas X responded, The honest truth is I don't want to speak on a lot of the homophobia within rap because I feel like this is a very dangerous playing field. It's more for my own safety rather than anything else. Also, adding that several days after he dropped the Montero music video, someone literally screamed and chased after him while he was driving away in his car, adding that he's now had to actually get security. But that said, and I, I would say that it's kind of the silver lining to this story, I don't imagine that we're gonna see a different Lil Nas X anytime soon. But there's always gonna be ignorance, there's always gonna be bigotry, and the only thing we can really control in this world is how we respond to it, who we want to be. And to that point, Lil Nas X told Variety, Honestly, I believe the pandemic helped me get out of the idea of trying to please everybody and the idea of he's a cool gay person, he's an acceptable gay person. I used to see things like that as a compliment, but it's not. And saying it just means you're a people pleaser and, and adding that this whole moment made him want to be even more authentic, let people know who he really was. You know, ultimately, I think this is an important story when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community. I think it's an important story when you're thinking about the world of rap, but I also think it really hits on a universal no. People suck. As long as humans exist, ignorance and bigotry will be a thing. That's a very unfortunate thing. So the, really the only thing you can do is focus on yourself. How you hold yourself in the face of adversity and how you react to dumb bullshit. Dumb and hateful and at times scary bullshit. Be unapologetically used while at the same time choosing and picking your battles and try to lead with love when possible. But from that, let's take a second to pay some bills and thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Squarespace. You know, over the past year, I know that many of you have found your passion projects and what truly makes you happy. And whether that means finally getting your independent business off the ground or creating a place to share your homemade goods, new favorite hobby, your obsession, maybe even a personal blog just to get the thoughts out of your head, Squarespace is there to help. You don't gotta worry because it's just so easy. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And creating an actually beautiful website with Squarespace's all-in-one platform has never been so simple. It's extremely intuitive and easy to use. Plus, and this is really high value, Squarespace gives you access to their marketing tools, analytics, and personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat. Whatever you need, they are available 24 seven to help out. So if you wanna check it out, see if it's right for you, see why so many others before you have loved it, go ahead and start your free trial today over at squarespace.com slash Phil. And when you realize you love it, make sure you enter an offer code Phil to get 10% off your first purchase. Then let's talk about this very big news, but also news I've seen a lot of confusion around. All right, so yesterday we talked about how the Senate passed a $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package. And pretty much just hours after that, early this morning, Democrats also managed to pass a $3.5 trillion budget plan with a vote of 50 to 49. But by no means does that mean this is a done deal, and I'll explain that in a second. Right, so as far as what this budget would do, among other things, would provide funding to expand Medicare, combat climate change, boost federal safety net programs, especially those aimed at children and low-income parents. Also including provisions for universal pre-K, new family leave benefits, Benefits, also aiming to help immigrants obtain a pathway to legal permanent residency. And to pay all of that, the plan seeks to rewrite tax law by increasing taxes on profitable corporations and the wealthy, AKA a slew of policy proposals in this budget that Republicans firmly oppose. That is why we saw that 50 to 49 vote. Now, as far as why this isn't a done deal, I mean, from here, the plan heads to the House where it will likely receive final congressional approval. And if and when that does happen, that means that then the Senate can pass an official bill on the budget through simple majority following negotiations with the House. And so in turn, that means that feasibly Democrats could pass this without any Republican support. But as we've talked about numerous times now, that's a challenge in its own right because several Democratic senators have expressed concerns about the plan's price tag. With that, of course, including Democratic Senator Joe Manchin, who said, given the current state of the economic recovery, it is simply irresponsible to continue spending at levels more suited to respond to a Great Depression or Great Recession, not an economy that is on the verge of overheating. But still, we're seeing Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer signaling that he hopes to have the official bill of the budget plan drafted by the week of September 15. Also responding to Manchin's concerns in a press conference saying, Look, there are some of my caucus who might believe it's too much. There are some of my caucus who believe it's too little. And adding, I can tell you this. In reconciliation, one, we are going to all come together to get something done. And two, it will have every part of the Biden plan in a big, bold, robust way. But also with that said, do not expect for this to be over anytime soon. This process, whether it fails or not, it will take several months. And to complicate matters even more, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has said that her chamber will not pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill until the Senate passes that official budget bill. Right? And that is actually largely an attempt to make sure that it passes at all since progressive Democrats in the chamber say that they'll refuse to approve the infrastructure bill unless a budget package is simultaneously approved with it. And they have the numbers. They have a caucus that is big enough to ensure that it would fail. And meanwhile, you have some moderate Democrats not wanting to couple these things together, calling for an immediate vote on the infrastructure bill. So, you know, ultimately the perfect setup for another shit show. Then let's talk about fires. Cause uh, when I say that the world 
is on fire. I'm not just speaking metaphorically anymore, unfortunately. Starting more local, we have updates regarding the Dixie Fire that's been ravaging Northern California for about a month now. It's the second largest wildfire in the state's history. As of this morning, it's seared through about half a million acres. It's only about 30% contained. But also, as you have brave crews battling the blaze, we're also seeing reports about an arrest of a suspect who allegedly set a series of additional fires around the area. And that person is 47-year-old Gary Stephan Maynard, who's a former part-time college lecturer in Sonoma State's Criminal Justice Department, who was reportedly living out of his car and traveling alone across Northern California. And if the court documents are 100% accurate, this guy is a next level scumbag. According to the documents, he entered the evacuation zone and then began setting fires behind the first responders that were fighting the Dixie Fire. Right? So in addition to trying to enlarge the Dixie Fire, threatening even more lives and property, it increased the direct danger to the first responders. With the documents saying that Maynard's fires were placed in the perfect position to increase the risk of firefighters being trapped between fires. And with this, reportedly Maynard has denied setting any fires following his arrest. Investigators also saying that he became enraged and started kicking the jail cell door. But ultimately right now, he's currently charged with willfully setting the ranch fire in Lassen County, and he could face up to five years in prison and a $250,000 fine. But like I said, it's the world that is on fire. It's not just California. Last week, Kuwait experienced a massive fire after the world's largest tire graveyard lit up. You also have Greece currently dealing with at least 586 wildfires throughout the country during one of the worst heat waves in decades. In a televised address on Monday, the prime minister went on to tell the nation that 63 organized evacuations had to take place as the fires approached towns and villages. So far, hundreds of homes have been destroyed, and with all of this, the government's response has been seen as inadequate by some, leading to protests outside of the Greek parliament on Monday. And with this, you have scientists believing that Southern Europe will experience wildfires like this more often as the region has increasingly experienced larger droughts. But it's also not just Greece. Algeria is now in its second day of combating large wildfires and it's going very poorly. So far there, at least 65 people have died in blazes, about half of which are soldiers who are deployed as emergency firefighters. And these fires are centered around a region around 60 miles east of the capital that is notoriously tough, remote, and has dry terrain. And the locals there are at least partially concerned that the fires were started by arson, with the country's prime minister saying on national TV that the 30 fires ravaging the region were highly synchronized, and adding, that leads one to believe these were criminal acts. And very unfortunately, this story could just go on and on because you have places like Italy, Turkey, Spain, Peru, and Lebanon also battling very large blazes. But uh, the last one that we need to address is the one that's been ravaging Russia for weeks now. Right, so the fires there are mostly confined to regions that we would call Siberia, which is a blessing and a curse. The region is heavily forested and droughts lead to massive forest fire seasons similar to what happens in parts of California. But unlike California, Siberia is sparsely populated with few population centers, meaning that there's only been a few evacuation orders. And as a matter of fact, most of the fires aren't even fought by firefighters and just allowed to burn out as part of the natural life cycle of the region. But you have scientists now concerned about the scope of this year's fire. So like much of the world, Siberia has become increasingly dry during the fire season, which exacerbates the problem. And its fires are so big that massive clouds of smoke can cover the region for weeks, which has its own ecological problems. And now this year's fires are so massive that for the first time, the smoke from them has managed to cover large sections of the North Pole. And that's a major red flag because it means that the fires are going further and further north, and the northernmost fires actually threaten to disturb the region's permafrost. And as we talked about recently, melting permafrost from climate change, and now these fires can release massive amounts of trapped greenhouse gases like methane, which exacerbates global warming in a way that quickly makes the entire situation one that we have less and less control over. And ultimately, with this story or really anything else that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below, because yes, this is a news show, but it's also a conversation. Whether you leave in that comment down below or not, as always, thank you for watching, liking, subscribing these daily news videos. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.